Welcome back. My name is Ant Hartz, and today is day 92 of 365 of studying and reading the Bible. And today we're reading from 1 Samuel chapters 4 through 5, and you already know what to do. Go ahead and hit the like button so that the word of God can spread to more people. And I hope everybody's having a blessed day. I have no complaints. Um, me and my fiance just filmed like two different videos for the podcast that we have coming out. So I can't wait to let you guys know more about that once we release it. We're going to pre-record a whole season worth and we decided to pick um, seven episodes, uh, you know, for this, you know, seven meaning, you know, the number of completion and stuff like that. So we decided to do seven episodes for the first season. We have a couple of more that we need to film and then just kind of do all the, you know, the marketing and all that other stuff. But I'm excited. Um, today we talked about two good topics. One was first, we were talking about lust and I did a whole bunch of my testimonial in my life going about that and just how to overcome it and stop losing to lust. And then the second one we did was about faith in relationships. So like, um, like faith in in friends and kind of just relationships in general. Um, there's another one that I can't remember exactly what it is, but like I said, I'm super excited for everything that's happening and everything that we're doing. So other than that, let's get into it. Before we start, let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father God, I thank you so much for another day. Lord, I thank you for just the little things that we overlook, God. Lord, this is a day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. On today, God, the things that stand out the most is just your grace and your mercy, God. Lord, we just thank you for everything that you have done in our lives. We thank you for just being such an amazing father, God, blessing us when we need the blessings and withholding all of the works of iniquity and the enemy and just making sure that we're protected and that we're on your path, God. Lord, we just thank you so much. And if you don't do another thing, Lord, you have done enough. Lord, we just ask to be more like you, to have a heart like yours, to love what you love and to hate what you hate. God, we just ask that every day we move closer to you and that as we seek you and draw near to you, that you also draw near to us. This and many more blessings in Jesus name. Amen. In chapter four, Israel loses battles against the Philistines and the Ark of God is captured. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped in Aphek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. In verses 1 through 11, we see that Israel loses the first battle versus the Philistines. And regardless and despite their loss, they still have resolve and they still have confidence as they seek the elders' guidance and begin to bring the ark of God with them. And it says that as they bring the ark of God into their tents, that the whole camp just gets this increase of of confidence. And it says that the earth begins to shake, right? Because, and what I'm saying is like, imagine yourself there. Imagine that we just took a loss. We just lost 4,000 men, but now our elders are telling us to seek the Lord's guidance and to bring the Lord into our campsite. And everyone comes together and we all feel like this is where our deliverance is going to come from. Now that we're bringing God a part of our lives, now that we're saying, God, we're putting you in this with us. Seek, We're seeking the victory. Lord, deliver us. Where that confidence must be coming from. It even says that because it was so loud, the Philistines heard it and was like, where could this confidence be coming from? Where could they possibly be mustering up the strength? They just lost 4,000. They just lost, period, right? It doesn't even make sense why they should be rejoicing. And it's from that that they learned that the, the covenant and the ark of God is 
amongst the Hebrews. And we also get a glimpse of the Philistines and how they have to come together and encourage themselves so that they don't lose to Israel. And despite all of that confidence, despite all of the cheering and everything like that, Israel still loses to the Philistines again. And they actually lose about 30,000 men, 34,000 total. And the Philistines also capture the Ark of God. And so I want to pause here because if you're wondering, why did God allow that to happen? Like in Judges, this is where God would come through. This is where God would bring the deliverance. So why doesn't, why doesn't God bring the deliverance here? And it's because this chapter four is the fulfillment of the prophecy God told Samuel, which he also passed forward to Eli. This is the fulfillment of that prophecy simply because of Eli's um, wicked sons and the fact that they were wicked and Eli never checked them. He never made sure to, to get them sanctified or, you know, for it to even be any consequence. And so this is like the cleansing of the house of Eli. And so everything that's happening is under the will of God. God is allowing this stuff to happen. Um, and then the second thing is before this battle, there is nothing talked about, at least in the Bible, where we see that. The Israelites are seeking guidance from God originally, right? They're kind of wanting God's will, but not God's way. Like, we don't have anything beforehand of saying that God even told them to go to war with the Philistines. This is just something that we get plopped right into, transition into, into chapter four, where we see that this is a battle and they lost, right? And now they're trying to put God in the midst of it, where this may have been something that God didn't even want them to do. This may have been a battle or something that God would have told them not to do, but yet they didn't seek God's they didn't seek God's guidance originally. And what I'm saying here is, in our own lives, we have to make sure that God is not a He's not an afterthought. Like we should be going to God, or we should be going to God before, not after right? God should be our first response, not our last resort. And when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh, that they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who dwells between the cherubim, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. Now when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp. So the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. Woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us, who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Also, the Ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, Die. 
In verses 12 through 18, Eli is now informed that both of his sons have now died and the ark was stolen, causing him to slip and break his neck. And like I said before, throughout this fulfillment of the prophecy, this is very much so like a cleansing of the house of Eli. Then a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line the same day and came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. Now when he came, there was Eli, sitting on a seat by the wayside watching, where his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, What does the sound of this tumult mean? And the man came quickly and told Eli. Eli was ninety-eight years old, and his eyes were so dim that they could not see. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from the battle, and I fled today from the battle line. What happened, my son? Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the Ark of God has been captured. Then it happened, when he made mention of the Ark of God, that Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for the man was old and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. Now his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child, due to be delivered, and when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured, that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and gave birth for her labor pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, Do not fear, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer, nor did she regard it. Then she named the child Ichabod. The glory has departed from Israel. Because the ark of God had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. In chapter 5, the Philistines think that they have defeated the Lord since they captured the ark of God. And I'm inferring here, but I assume that the reason why they believe that they have now won and that they have captured God himself is because they worship idols, right? They worship Dagon, who is an idol to be their God, right? And so they believe that if we've captured what it seems that the Hebrew Israelites God is, which is they believe that it's the ark, which instead we know that the ark is truly like a throne of God on earth instead of actually God himself. And when you bring the, the throne of God into the camp, it is like you're inviting the presence of the Lord to be with you. And instead, they believe that it's actually God himself and they capture it and they feel like because they have caught it that they now have detained God. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ash. Verses two through four kind of made me laugh when I read it. And it's because they take the Ark of God and they put it in their pagan temples alongside their God, little G, um, Dagon. And then we see Yahweh do something pretty funny. And it's actually, not only is it funny, but it's also weighted, right? It's also pretty heavy when we look at it. And it says that Yahweh repeatedly knocks down Dagon face down in front of the Ark of the Covenant, which is the throne of God on earth. With the first thing that popped into my head is, 
every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so in my head, I was like already thinking when I saw it knocked down it, and it said face down. Now Dagon is in a posture of worship because it's right in front of the Ark of the Covenant, which is the throne of God. So they have God, <laughs> God knocked down Day Dagon in a way where he is like this. And I just think that that is such, it's it's funny because he does it multiple times, but I think the, the real thing to get out of it is that there is no other God. There is no God except God, right? There is no God except Yahweh. He is the Lord of Lords and the Kings of Kings. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the creators of He is the creator of the ends of the earth. That is the part that stands out the most to me throughout today's reading is simply the fact that God will make other gods bow down to God. When the Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the Ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. In verse 6 through 12, we see that everywhere that the ark was, God came against those people, spreading tumors and destruction until they decided to return the ark back to the Hebrews. But the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh toward us and Dagon, our God. Therefore, they sent and gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines. What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried away to Gath. So they carried the ark of the God of Israel away. So it was, after they had carried it away, that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he struck the men of the city, both small and great, and tumors broke out on them. Therefore, they sent the Ark of God to Ekron. So it was, as the Ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, they have brought the Ark of the God of Israel to us, to kill us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines. Send away the Ark of the God of Israel, and let it go back to its own place, so that it does not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who did not die were stricken with the tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. And I haven't done this in a while, but I want to do a, a brief reading summary just because I feel like the Holy Spirit is moving and I really feel the presence. And it's simply because of the fact that we serve an almighty God. We see it, I feel like this was just a great reading to, to really see how powerful God truly is. That although it seems like his people are down and out, it's only because they're going through a process for his plan. That 
there's some standards that must be kept. And because they weren't keeping the standards, they had to face the consequences. It's not because he was incapable of saving them. It's not because the Philistines were just so much greater than his people. No, because we see that just simply through the ark of God, through the throne being taken and placed in the in temples that it should never be that it is blasphemy for them for the ark of god to even be in these pagan temples that those people suffer the consequence that god was killing the people and making those people suffer more than the hebrews were and he didn't need to even pick up a sword he didn't even need to come down physically that just he can use anything to <laughs> y'all regardless god's will will be done and so what is the takeaway? I always try to find a takeaway out of scripture and how we can apply it to our lives. And the biggest thing for me that's standing out is just to remember the God that you serve. Like in every day, as we go through our lives to remember who do we serve and remember what our God is capable of and that he operates in the impossible. He doesn't operate on the same planet or, or the same plane as man does. He doesn't have the limitations that we have. God is capable of doing almighty things. And so it's important that we take this as a sign to remember who God really is. And if God has did it before, he can do it again. All the promises, everything that he has done, all we have to do is submit and surrender unto God's will. And I promise you that we will live a better life for it. But that's all for day 92, and I hope it was a blessing to you. And go ahead and let me know in the comment section, which was your favorite part of this reading? What chapter, what verse stood out to you the most? I already said what mine was, but let me know because I want to kind of know, you know, what stood out to you. And if this was a blessing to you, go ahead and share this with three other people who need to hear this too. And if you're ready for the next reading, I'll meet you there.